thing about the introduction. I teach at the University of Illinois at Chicago, not the University of Chicago. Uh, let's you know, hear it for public education. Uh, uh, I also uh, want to say my students know that I'm very low tech, okay? Uh, and we have lots of jokes in class about how low tech I am. Uh, but the presentation today, as you'll see, has really a lot of illustrations, and I'm hoping I do it right. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, uh, aside from that, uh, let me just begin by saying that um, I am doing something a little different today from what I normally do when I speak. Uh, usually when I give a talk, uh, I'm presenting my own research, which obviously I know inside out. Uh, and so I talk from an extended outline because it's easy for me to fill in the blanks as I'm talking. Today, however, I will actually be reading from a text because I'm presenting the work of someone else. So, uh, just in case any of you are thinking right now, plagiarist, you know, <laughs> presenting the work of someone else, uh, let me explain why I'm doing that. Uh, Alan Berube, uh, whose work I'm presenting, uh, was a self-trained, community-based historian who began researching LGBT history back in the 1970s in San Francisco. Uh, he was a founder then of the San Francisco Lesbian and Gay History Project, and 30 plus years later, it's morphed into other bigger organizations and still exists and does really, really impressive work. Uh, Alan started off doing local history research, San Francisco, and he would get a whole series of talks that he gave around the Bay Area and was really visible as a historian at a time when not many people were doing that. And so one day, Alan got a phone call, uh, and the person says, are you, you know, the Alan who does all this? And Alan said yes, and he said, well, a friend of mine just moved into a new apartment, and there's a big box of letters in the closet, and we've been looking at these letters, and it seems to be a big set of letters, hundreds of them, that were written by a group of gay GIs to each other during World War II. Uh, and Alan almost died, you know, as <laughs> is possible. Um, and it led him on a, a ten-year project of research, interviewing public talks, that eventually led to the publication of Coming Out Under Fire, uh, which is what he's best known for. Uh, a history of gay men and lesbians during World War II. Uh, and, uh, and in the process of doing that book and giving all those talks, he created environments where a lot of World War II veterans came together, met each other, came out of the closet, and it's probably responsible for why, in part, why the gays in the military debate erupted the way it did in 1993. Okay, meanwhile, uh, at some point in his research, and he, he interviewed a lot of people in the San Francisco area, uh, at some point in his research, he started encountering guys who would say to him, well, you know, it's really good that you're doing this book about World War II, but you know, there were, a lot of us didn't go into the military. We were merchant seamen. Uh, and you know, you really should do a book and start interviewing people before we all die uh, about the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union, because it was really something. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, this union was multiracial, it was really radical, and it was actually very gay friendly, if you can believe it. Uh, and so Alan started doing a lot of research on it in the labor press, uh, he did a lot of interviews, union archives, uh, things like that. Uh, and sure enough, he uncovered uh, what I think of as a, a truth stranger than fiction story uh, of a multiracial, left-wing, queer-friendly union way before gay liberation and Stonewall uh, and before there were any functioning LGBT organizations in the United States. Um, Alan, who was a very, very good friend, uh, passed away, died suddenly and very unexpectedly in 2007. Uh, at the time that he died, uh, he was still working on the book, uh, and he had several incomplete drafts of the book uh, that were different from each other. 
Uh, but he also had, uh, he used to give a talk on the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union. Uh, his version of it was two hours long. This one wouldn't be two hours long. Uh, but nobody, I understand, ever got up and laughed because it was so absorbing. Uh, anyway, what, what Estelle Friedman and I, who were the literary executors of his estate, what we've tried to do is to put the talk, a shorter version of the talk together with some of the illustrations that he had, the visuals that he had, um, to give a sense of what his research was because it is so unique and so important. Um, and after the talk, uh, I'm really happy uh, not only to get comments, but also to answer questions about the material, uh, but also uh, if you want to ask me questions about Alan and his work more generally. Uh, he had a lot of Chicago connections. He was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, though he never graduated. Um, and he interviewed a number of veterans here for coming out under fire. And I know he gave his talk quite a number of years ago on the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union here in Chicago um, at least a couple of different times. So anyway, with that as a little bit of background, um, uh, let's get started. Uh, hopefully we'll get started. <laughs> so, Em, I'm not getting any, uh, unlike, be patient, unlike in our practice session. Ah, okay, there we are. Um, so, um, this is the title of the talk that he gave. So before we go on, is it, Anne, can I ask you, is it shifting because you're doing something or because I'm actually hitting at some point the right thing? So, do, do you want to do it? Okay, so there, there are a lot. I'm going to keep going like this, okay? All right. Uh, e -e. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, the Luline is about to embark on her maiden voyage from San Francisco to Honolulu. 
Among her passengers is William Roth, who is the president of the Masson Shipping Line, his wife, Lurleen, and his family. Also aboard are business executives and government officials, society women, and teenage debutantes. As the passengers walk up the gangway, they see longshoremen down below, busily loading their trunks along with the ship's supplies. The Lurleen is the queen of the Masson Company's new quartet of luxury liners. Her sister ships are the Malola, the Monterey, and the Mariposa. They are the grandest American passenger liners sailing the Pacific Ocean. They have been nicknamed the White Ships because their hulls are painted a dazzling white that makes them stand out with a gleaming radiance on the blue Pacific waters. The Matson liners also stand out with another kind of whiteness. The purser and the rest of the service staff who politely greet the Roth family, carry their luggage, and lead them along the corridors to their first class suites are white men and boys. So are the longshoremen and the officers and the crew of the ship. These workers are white because Mr. Roth's policy is to hire only white men. The maritime unions have their own whites-only policies, too. The ship slides out from Pier 32 to begin her long voyage to the Hawaiian Islands and the South Seas. In travel brochures and magazine ads, the Matson Company has constructed a colorful fantasy world in which smiling Hawaiian women and men invite white tourists to their islands. islands which Masson partly owns, and which the United States has colonized as its territory. Mr. Roth is gambling that there are still enough people with money during the Depression to pay for the expensive luxury cruises to make his new ocean liners profitable. The round-trip fare for a two-week cruise starts at $250. This was a long time ago. Uh, his gamble is paying off. Even the most luxurious suites that cost up to $2,400 a week sold out months ago. This maiden voyage of the Lurleen is reserved for first-class passengers who swim and play tennis and after dinner dance to the sounds of Hawaiian musicians. Here is every aspect of luxurious living Matson's travel brochure promises. And naturally, the service is impeccable. Far below deck, where passengers never go, the stewards who provide this impeccable service are living a very different maritime existence. Most of the 350 members of the Lurleen's crew work in the steward's department. They are usually all men, but occasionally two or three women work as nurses or stewardesses. Many stewards will never see the light of day while the Lurleen is at sea because they are forced to live and work below the waterline with no portholes and no fresh air. They sleep in hot, cramped quarters they call the glory hole. Mr. Roth's company requires his stewards to work up to 16 hours per day, seven days a week, with no overtime pay and often no time off in port. He pays a messman $6 a week. Under these conditions, Mr. Roth expects his stewards to greet passengers with a smile, carry their bags, manage the front desk, wait on passengers in the dining room and on the desks, deliver room service, serve the drinks, cook the meals, wash the dishes and pots and pans, feed the crew, make the beds, and put away the clothes and linens, nurse the passengers who get seasick, cut and style their hair, and more. The few who serve passengers directly can sometimes receive good tips. But at night, when the stewards finally tum stumble below deck, sitting on their hammocks and bunks. 
They dished the passengers, their supervisors, and the ship owners. Matson calls the luxury liners floating hotels, but the stewards call their quarters floating tenements. There were 40 workers in one glory hole, Jim Vieira, a former steward, says. We were sleeping above the engine room. If you set your shoes on the deck when you went to bed, in the morning they'd be curled up. The toes were meeting the heels from the heat. As a teenager, Jim Vieira went to sea on the Masson liners as a scullion, washing dishes in the galley. He quickly works his way above deck as a first-class room steward. His service is so good that the Roths choose him to be their personal room steward whenever they sail to Hawaii. On his first trip out, young Jim Vieira notices something queer among the stewards. In the galley, he recalls, or in the dining room, when there weren't any passengers around, all the stewards called each other by girls' names. Miss this and miss that. When he gets up the nerve to ask them why they did this, they say, why, doesn't everybody do it? <laughs> well, he realizes, I guess I must be a girl, too. So that's how Vieira discovers that there are lots of other gay teenagers and men like him on the liners. The cooks and stewards are at the bottom of the crew's social hierarchy, below the captain and his officers, the firemen in the engine department, and the sailors or deckhands in the deck department, who all do the traditional manly work. The stewards do what is stereotyped as the woman's work or colored work, the personal service and the housekeeping. Some stewards' jobs are also stereotyped as queer work, activities that gay men are, especially, are supposed to be especially good at. Pastry chefs, waiters, <coughs> bedroom stewards, wine stewards, florists, hairdressers, and telephone operators. Although anybody can work these jobs, many of the stewards doing queer work are, in fact, gay men. This is no secret, even in the 1930s. It was never, never hidden, Jim Vieira says. I can't say that the stewards were 100% gay, but say 65 to 70%, and everybody knew it. Rumor has it that the Matson Company likes to employ gay stewards on its ships. A Matson official once told Vieira that, quote, if it wasn't for the boys, who else would we get to do that kind of women's work, to turn down the beds and lay out the ladies' nightgowns? What the Masson official also meant was, what other white men are we going to get who'll do this colored work on our all-white crews? So many of the stewards on the Masson liners are gay that the ships themselves earn queer nicknames among seamen. They call the Lurleen, the Queerly, the Madsonia, the Fruitsonia, and the Mariposa, the Mariposa, or Fairy Posa. Crewmen on freighters call Masson's white liners the fruit boats or the fruit ships. This kind of contempt was known among stu uh, stewards as queer baiting. Gay stewards prefer to call themselves queens. Queens are open, daring, and know how to take care of themselves. Queer is not their word. Queer is hurled at them from the outside to insult them, as in, you goddamn fruit queer. But queen is respectful inside talk. When you like them, explains Pete Brownlee, a straight waiter who worked on the Matson liners, you call them a queen. And on some ships, there are queens who reign supreme. Manuel Cabral, known as the Honolulu Queen, is an outrageous, acid-tongued Portuguese-Hawaiian waiter on the Matson liners. 
straight seamen are careful never to cross him. In private, queens and other gay men call each other waitresses or stewardesses, union sisters as well as union brothers. We didn't use the word gay, Jim Vieira says. No, it was girls' names, or Miss, Miss Cook, Miss McCormick, Miss Blair. Generally, queens camp it up only in the crew sections of a liner, the galley, the glory hole, and the alleyways. When they were around the passengers, they knew not to flitter and flutter, explains John Cremona, another straight steward. Sometimes the camping turns into a drag show, such as this one, that stewards from the Lurleen put on as a benefit for orphans in Hawaii. Most of the time, the passengers don't know about the gaiety that's going on below them, nor do they overhear the stewards complaining about their inhumane living and working conditions. Even among themselves, stewards have to be careful about talking union because Mr. Roth and his fellow ship owners will fire any union organizers in the crew. The Cooks and Stewards Union, which once tried to improve wages and conditions, is now weak and can protect them from being fired. They and other West Coast Seamen's Unions lost a major strike in 1921. They lost their union hiring hall too. Their wages fell, their living and working conditions worsened, and union membership declined. Stewards and other seamen are now hired by dock, by agents off the docks in what waterfront workers call shape-ups. You bribe the agent to get and keep your job. Seamen have no minimum wage and no right to strike. They are temporary workers who don't make enough money to get married and support a family. Many are not US citizens. They are treated as social outcasts and are at the ship owner's mercy. Not every Pacific liner has a totally white crew. The dollar shipped steamship line, which owns more ships than any other US company, competes with Matson for the Asian trade. R. Stanley Dollar, the company's president, is known for hiring seamen in China at one-third the pay that white American stewards get. This increases his profits while keeping his crews racially divided so that they can't organize. When the Matson Company hires Asian stu stewards at all, they have to work in the laundry room and sleep in their own separate quarters. This divide and conquer strategy works. Ch ship owners exploit Chinese workers while white unions attack them, sometimes with violence. The Marine Cooks and Stewards Union, like nearly all unions on the West Coast, has built its solidarity by excluding Asian workers from its ranks. They formed their union in 1901 to protect themselves from what their constitution called, quote, competition from alien and inferior races. Even Chinese American stewards were not allowed to become union members. On the West Coast, union meant white and male. By 1933, Revels Caton has been a steward on West Coast ships since he was 14. But neither the Masson nor the Dollar Line will hire him or other black stewards to work on their liners. Caton is the grandson of Hiram Revels of Mississippi, who after Reconstruction was the first black United States Senator. For years, Caton had sailed on the H.F. Alexander and other Alexander liners. In 1921, white seamen went out on strike and the shipping company hired black strike breakers to replace them. For years, strike breaking had been a form of black protest against racist union policies that excluded them. When white seamen lost that strike, the Alexander ships kept the black stewards at lower pay and as an insurance against future strikes by white unions. 
These newly employed stewards formed an association financed by the ship owners that was in reality a company union. In return, the black stewards agreed to stay away from the real unions. Hiring agents tell the white cooks and stewards working for Matson they are lucky to be working at all. But the workers are still angry about their worsening conditions, and they are scared to death of being fired for organizing. They feel powerless, and they feel, and they appear to be hopelessly divided. Racial hostility, queen baiting, union busting, keep their divisions wide open and raw, and keep alive their fear of losing what little they have. But below a deceptively calm surface, you can see signs of change. Take the Alexander ships. Black stewards are segregated, but they are developing leaders. The company union on the Alexander ships won't let Revels Caton sail anymore because he's joined the Communist Party. So Caton is hanging around the waterfront learning to organize his fellow unemployed workers. His dream is to organize the black seamen into a real union. In port cities from coast to coast, other left-wing maritime workers, many of them communists, some of them gay, are organizing too. It was an underground movement of wonderful left-wingers, recalled Ted Rolfs, a gay left-wing steward. These guys were so inspiring in their objective, which was to create a union of the rank and file and make it democratic. In June 1933, okay, go, I'll get another one, yes, okay. In June 1933, President Roosevelt is signing the National Industrial Recovery Act after months of debate in Congress and despite the strong opposition of big business. He calls the NIRA a new covenant among employers, workers, and government that will bring the country out of the depression. The law guarantees a new deal for labor. It guarantees their right to organize and bargain collectively. It protects them from being fired for joining a union. It ends employee attacks, employer attacks on union organizing drives and union elections. It paves the way for a minimum wage and maximum hours. And it bans company unions. A few weeks later, President Roosevelt tells the nation, it is obvious that without united action, a few selfish men will pay starvation wages and insist on long hours of work. Now, the workers of this country have rights under this law which cannot be taken away from them. Merchant seamen are stunned at what they hear. The president is actually promising them that the federal government will defend their right to organize into unions so that they can stop the ship owners from exploiting them. United Mine Workers President John L. Lewis, who helped write the law, puts it more bluntly. The president wants you to organize, he tells workers who are in unions. Within weeks, the most dramatic wave of labor organizing in US history sweeps the nation. On the ships and waterfronts, rank and file seamen and longshoremen begin to take over their weak and corrupt unions. They're even talking about going out on strike. When the Monterey returns to San Francisco from a cruise in the South Pacific, Jim Vieira and other stewards walk down the gangway onto the Madison Pier. They see strikers marching along the waterfront. While they were at sea, the Longshoremen's Union had gone out on strike for union recognition, for decent wages, for their own hiring hall. The Seamen's Unions, including the Marine Cooks and Stewards Unions, decided to join them. Together, they are now shutting down all shipping on the West Coast. As more ships come into port and more crews walk off, the strike spreads. 
Before long, a hundred ships are tied up in San Francisco Bay, including the Masson White Liners, the Dollar Liners, and the Alexander ships. Anchored in the bay is a scab ship set up by the Dollar Liner to house the strike breakers. Ship owner agents are trying to recruit unemployed black men as strike breakers again. But the longshoremen, for the first time, open their union to black workers. The Marine Cooks and Stewards Union does the same thing. And now, for the first time, leaders of the black community call for black workers not to break this strike, but instead to work with white unions to win it. Rebels Caton tells the black stewards they can't survive in a company union and their only hope is to join the marine cooks and stewards. They are skeptical. Many black stewards decide not to scab this time, but they stay off the picket lines. They want proof that the white union's talk about racial equality will turn into action. But other black stewards do join the white pickets. They stand together against police and get arrested together too. The idea of solidarity with white working men is a huge act of faith for these stewards. They are staking their futures on the outside chance that if white unions win this strike, white men will treat them as equals and come to their defense when they are attacked. Nothing in their experience tells them that they can trust the white unions to do this, but they are taking the risk anyway. The Marine Cooks and Stewards Union sets up strike kitchens on all the waterfronts. In San Francisco, the Maritime Palace Kitchen serves 15,000 meals a day to strikers. Among the men preparing and serving the meals are black stewards from Alexander ships and Asian stewards from Dollar Line ships. Gay stewards of many races are also working in the strike kitchens. The worst day of the strike is on July 5th, when the ship owners use force to reopen the port of San Francisco. When police approach the picket line and strikers refuse to leave, police shoot tear gas and bullets into the crowd, hitting bystanders as well as strikers. All along the waterfront, fighting breaks out between strikers and police. Blood ran red in the streets of San Francisco, one reporter writes in the Chronicle. The furies of street warfare raged for hour piled on hour. Hundreds were injured or badly gassed. Two were dead. One was dying. Thirty-two others shot and more than three score sent to hospitals. The strikers call this bloody Thursday. The two strikers who the police shot in the back and killed were Howard Sperry, a longshoreman, and Nicholas Bordois, a cook. The Marine Cooks and Stewards Union adopts Bordois as one of their own. Three days later, on a Sunday afternoon, the city of San Francisco stops to honor the two men killed on bloody Thursday. Tens of thousands of Union men and women march in a silent procession from the waterfront up Market Street. After the funeral, nearly all San Francisco unions, in solidarity with the maritime workers, go out on a general strike that shuts down the city and most of the West Coast. With this support, the longshoremen win their demands. Two years later, the seamen also win their demands in a strike supported by longshoremen. The victories are part of a wave of union organizing in which millions of women, people of color, industrial workers, and tenant farmers are organizing for the first time. Union membership in the United States more than triples from 3 million to 9 million members in just a few years. The stewards' lives are finally beginning to improve. 
their wages go up, and now they are paid for overtime. They have their own hiring hall, with the power to hire crews for each ship based on seniority, not on payoffs. The hundreds of black stewards on the Alexander ships have left the company union en masse and joined the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union. The Chinese stewards on the dollar line on the dollar ships are allowed to join the union as well. Chinese American and African American stewards, though, are still on second segregated ships and have second class union status. And the Lurleen still has an all white crew. After the strikes are over, the Lurleen is back at sea. At 4 p.m. on July 5th, 1935, the crew stops their work and gathers on the deck to observe this anniversary of Bloody Thursday. During the ceremony, a member of the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union addresses the entire crew. He is Frank McCormick, who was active on the strike committee. He is a communist, and it's no secret that Frank is a gay man. Sperry and Burdois, he says, we shall not forget you. We shall not forget the blood and roses on the pavement or the magnificent ideal of justice and militancy for which you died. Mickey Blair and Frank McCormick met while, while Mickey was wandering the San Francisco waterfront after the strikes. Mickey is a teenager who's been kicked out of the army and his home when it's discovered that he's gay. On the San Francisco piers, he notices this handsome man, 20 years his senior, giving a speech to a crowd, and he finds this man very attractive. Mainly, it was his lovely speaking voice, Mickey says. He liked the way Frank was so sure of himself as a union militant and as a gay man. They start a courtship that lasts many years. Mickey eventually joins the union, and the two men start to live as a couple. On the day they first meet, Frank McCormick is already a member of the Communist Party. The party's policy is that homosexuals cannot become members because homosexuality is a form of bourgeois decadence. But Frank McCormick was drawn to the party's vision of a better world for working people of many races. Rebels Caton joined the Communist Party because he wanted to combine what he called Negro rights with working class politics. In the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union, he has a chance to do this. After the strikes, the stewards voted for equal shipping to all members and against keeping black stewards segregated on the Alexander ships. So now the time has come to begin integrating the white ships. Rebels Caton has become the spokesman for the Black Stewards. His strongest ally is his friend Tom Baker, a militant unionist who doesn't care who knows he's gay. This gay white man and straight black man work together as a team. Their strategy is to link racial integration with better wages and conditions so that the white men can experience integration as a real benefit to them. But the deckhands and the firemen sometimes threaten any black steward who dares to integrate a white ship. When the Union in Seattle dispatches two black messmen onto a dollar liner, both are attacked and severely injured by white deckhands before the vessel gets to Yokohama. To prevent this kind of violence, they find big, strong longshoremen and, and stewards to escort the black stewards up the gangway and protect them from being thrown overboard once the ship goes out to sea. The union brings charges against anyone who threatens their members and ties up a ship if a white crew refuses to sail with a black steward on board. By the late 1930s, the Matson ships are finally becoming integrated. When the Alexander ships go out of business, black stewards are reassigned to the white liners as jobs become available, and several are elected delegates 
by a majority of white men, many of them gay. After winning their strikes, the cooks and stewards begin to make their union more democratic. On each ship, they elect a delegate to represent them. Right away, the stewards start to elect gay men, like Mickey Blair. One day, a crew member from another department comes to Blair and says, you're going to have to get rid of Frank Bowers because he's too flamboyant. Blair calls the accuser into a steward's meeting and asks him, can you prove that this man wasn't doing his job? Did he break any rules of the contract? No. Well, then get your ass out of here, Blair tells him. The Marine Cooks and Stewards Union is going way out on a limb. It's full of communists, its queens are getting bolder, and it's recruiting men of color. Other seamen begin to attack the union by baiting its most vulnerable and controversial members, pointing fingers and calling them names. The newspaper of the Sailors Union of the Pacific, which is anti-black, anti-communist, and anti-gay, calls them the Marine Cooks and Fruits. Sailors and firemen hurl racial insults at the stewards of color and even the white stewards. They attack the Marine Cooks and Stewards leaders as Reds. Some hostile seamen put these insults all together and call the Union a third Red, a third Black, and a third Queer. Rebels Caton, Tom Baker, and Frank McCormick meet with other left-wing activists to develop a more organized strategy for the Union to respond. The Union's enemies are already connecting red, black, and queer. So they come up with a slogan that captures what they're searching for. <laughs> it's anti-Union to red bait, race bait, or queen bait. Or, if you let them red bait, they'll race bait. And if you let them race bait, they'll queen bait. These are all connected. It's why we have to stick together. Mounted over the Union Hall's job board is the CIO motto, equality in hiring regardless of race, religion, nationality, or political opinion. With this spirit in place, the members of the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union prepare themselves to go to war. During World War II, the passenger liners are converted to carry troops, and the building of new ships opens jobs for cooks and stewards. The membership of the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union grows from 4,500 to over 15,000 members as men flock into the Union for wartime jobs. Some are gay men who want to serve their country but don't want to join the military because of its anti-gay policies. Or they are gay men the Navy has already discharged as homosexuals. Some new members are black and Filipino men who want to serve at sea but won't tolerate the Navy's racist Jim Crow policies. By the end of 1945, African American men make up more than half the Union's membership. Other new members are white men who've never before had to treat men of color as equals. When some of them provoke racist incidents on the ships, Union officials launch a campaign to teach these men racial tolerance. At its wartime convention, the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union protests after the government removes Japanese American stewards from the ships as national security risks. The Union takes the anti-Asian language out of its own constitution. The members also expand economic democracy within their Union. From 1945 to 1949, the Marine Cooks and Stewards triples a messman's wages. When unemployment hits the Union hard, the rank and file votes to start a swing system for sharing jobs. Union officials draw no pay during strikes, and they have to work on the ships for at least one trip every year. The Marine Cooks and Stewards Union is earning a reputation as one of the most democratic, 
racially integrated and pro-gay unions in the United States. But the Korean War is heating up, and the Cooks and Stewarts opposes US using US merchant ships to send troops and supplies to Korea. In the anti-communist and anti-gay hysteria of the early 1950s, the Marine Cooks and Stewarts suddenly becomes an easy target. The government uses two powerful new weapons to attack the left-wing unions. One is Coast Guard screening of maritime workers, which eliminates suspected radicals from working on ships. It begins in the fall of 1950 through the Port Security Act, based on a Senate report calling for securing the nation's seaports, quote, against sabotage through conspiracy of subversives and moral perverts. Marine Cooks and Stewarts members like Ted Rolfs and Mickey Blair are escorted down the gangway one day. By January 1951, the Coast Guard has removed nearly every left-wing steward from West Coast ships. Three quarters of those screened are African-American men. At Mickey Blair's appeal hearing, they ask him if he's a homosexual. And they ask him if Hugh Bryson, the president of the MCS, is queer too. Why do you want to know about our president, Mickey snaps back. Do you want to go out on a date with him? The government uses its other powerful weapon, the Taft-Hartley law, to declare the Marine Cooks and Stewards hiring call illegal and postpones its strikes and forces its members to swear they're not communists before they can hold elections. Self-identified right-wing dissidents use Taft-Hartley to set up a rival union. They're anti-communist and anti-gay, and they attack the Marine Cooks and Stewards for giving special rights to Negroes. They're encouraged when the CIO, in its own anti-communist purge, kicks out the longshoremen and cooks and stewards unions, along with other left-led unions. Most black stewards stay with their union, but white men are split, including the gay stewards, who start to take sides and attack each other. In December 1953, thousands of white right, white right wing stewards and sailors armed with bottles, knives, clubs, and guns, march along the waterfront to Pier 39. They want to take over a ship that is still controlled by the old marine cooks and stewards. The marchers attack a multiracial group of longshoremen and stewards. After a violent struggle, police and marine cooks and stewards pickets win this battle and turn back the right wingers. But the Union is not winning the war. Within a year, the right-wing Union, under government-supervised election, takes over the MCS, even though nearly all of its members vote to stay independent. Then, the MCS president, Hugh Bryson, is charged and convicted of perjury under the Taft-Hartley law for stating that he wasn't a communist. He's sentenced to five years in prison. J. Edgar Hoover's FBI agents stalk Frank McCormick, Mickey Blair, Jim Vieira, and the other screen seamen. FBI agents keep them under 24-hour surveillance, outing stewards as homosexuals and communists to their families, landlords, and employers. They get them evicted from their homes and fired from what few jobs they can find. The members of this tiny union could never win their David and Goliath battle against the combined forces of Congress, the Coast Guard, the FBI, the ship owners, the AFL, and the CIO. But they went down fighting. It's remarkable that they held out for so long. Their history is unknown today because through fear and intimidation, it was first rewritten as an un-American activity, then dismissed as an insignificant failure, and finally erased from our nation's memory as if what they had achieved had never happened. 
In the early 1960s, if you wandered along San Francisco's waterfront, you'd see little evidence left from the great battles that once were fought on these now empty streets and piers. The American passenger liners are gone. Their owners registered them under foreign flags to avoid US taxes, as well as safety laws and unions. Shipping declined and the piers grew deserted. But gay men of many races continue to occupy the old waterfront haunts, bringing them back to life as gay bars and restaurants. Over in the Castro district, which isn't a gay neighborhood yet, you might run into Frank McCormick and Mickey Blair, who have set up house together in an apartment upstairs from their pal, Jim Vieira. Jim is still working as a steward on the ships. He successfully appealed his screening. Frank works as a waiter in a restaurant. Mickey works as a nursing attendant. A few years later, Frank McCormick and Mickey Blair moved to Seattle to buy a house where they lived together for years. After Frank dies in the 1970s, Mickey still finds ways to keep his militancy alive. In the 1990s, he joins ACT UP in Seattle, and he performs in a gay theater group fighting the religious right. Although Mickey is passionate about gay politics, he knows that the gay movement is missing the commitment to working class folks and people of color that he learned in the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union. He still dreams about militant unions with visible gay leadership that are dedicated to racial equality and economic justice and solidarity across many lines. We proved that it could be done, so it's not just a dream. We can do it again, Blair says, only differently this time. And that's a picture of Alan and Mickey from the 1990s. So thank you. Okay, so the question is, and I'm really glad you asked that question, um, is um, in relationship to Alan's work on this, uh, I said that he left uh, several incomplete drafts, and so where are things? Uh, 
In going through all of his papers, um, what was very easy to find were the talks that he gave um, and the lectures. Uh, and so we've been able to put this together, talk together. And in um, the uh, My Desire for History, which is a broad collection of his writings, we have a couple of pieces that are about the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union. Uh, so that there's some of this is in print. But meanwhile, in terms of the book drafts, oh god. Uh, so there are at least three drafts that are incomplete. Uh, there's a little bit of a fourth that's quite a mess. But, but of the three drafts, it's not like there's draft one, there's draft two which got better, and there's draft three which got better than that, but it's still incomplete. Each draft is a completely new start over where Alan revamped his conception of the book and how to write it and how to organize it. So, um, so some of the stories obviously relate to each other, but they're very different. Now, having read them all, the third draft, which is the one where we'll call it the last draft, the one that he was working on at the time that he passed away, there are 80 pages, which are the way he structured it, the first 80 pages, you know, typewritten pages of a book. And I have to tell you, they're word perfect. It would take like maybe one quick read with a little bit of copy edit editing. Then there are another 80 pages that are in the same voice and structure that continue from those first 80 pages, but they'll need a little more editing and fixing up so that they're as good and complete as the first. Then there's another 80 or so pages that is really an outline of what the rest of the book is supposed to be. However, do not think that means it's two-thirds done because those 160 pages that are written versus the 80 pages that are a draft, those 160 pages are probably less than half of the story. So we have a really incomplete manuscript at this stage. Now, what Estelle and I have talked about, I mean, after we put this book, this collection of essays together to think about how this can be rescued, um, we've, we've had three strategies. One strategy we've been trying for the last five years, and it has not worked uh, yet. And that is, we've, we've gone in search of a labor historian, somebody who knows 20th century US labor history really, really well, and to, and to say to them, here, you can have this all if you do it, you know, if you finish the book, and we'll work with you based on what we know. And two or three have expressed interest, and then it just hasn't panned out. Um, second option uh, is uh, that she and I, although I think in reality it would be me, uh, will get together, will sit with the material and see, based on those other two drafts that are discarded, if the stories are in those first two drafts that aren't in the last one, in the parts that are unwritten, to see whether I can kind of construct the whole book. That won't be what Alan wrote, you know, but it'll be, as, it'll be close, it'll be in the right direction. Uh, and I'm not sure that that isn't going to happen until I retire. There's no way that I can do it while I'm still working. Um, and option, the final option, if option two doesn't happen, is that we'll put all of the drafts online on a website uh, so that other people who are interested in the story or might want to build on the research can do it themselves. So that's kind of where we stand on it right now.